there. This is, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the other side, a program of community counseling of Bristol County. My name is Jeff Rothman. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes. I'm very honored to have Dr. Mark Goldblatt with us, who's um, with Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital, and is the president of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Thank you for being here, Mark. It's my pleasure. Um, I guess we have, we have a lot to get through, so we'll, we'll do our best. Um, why is it that people commit suicide? Well, it's a difficult question. I think there's many answers to that. But what we do know about people who take their own lives is that they're suffering some unbearable feelings. And these unbearable feelings usually rise to a very, very intolerable level. And sometimes these feelings are sadness, and sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's isolation. But in either case, what happens is they seem to give up hope. So there's unbearable feelings, hopelessness, and almost always this has to do with a mental illness. Okay, now with AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, what, what kind of things are you working on to get the word out that, you know, I, I, when we were talking before we came on air, you had said suicide's preventable. I think a lot of people who are in the blinders of suicide and can't think of anything else, what, are, what kind of things are you working on to let people know suicide is preventable? Well, let's start with AFSP. American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is a national organization, and we raise a lot of money, millions of dollars, to fund re research into preventing suicide. We also have conferences, usually once or twice a year, where we have people who've lost somebody to suicide come and get support, and we have support groups for survivors. So that's our mission, to prevent suicide and to help the people who lost somebody to suicide. Well, how do you prevent suicide? Earlier on, I said that uh, people usually kill themselves with unbearable feelings and that this is associated usually with some sort of mental illness. Almost always, people who kill themselves have a depression. Just about all people have unipolar or bipolar depression when they think of killing themselves. So if we can treat mental illness, we can prevent depression. Okay, when, when treating mental illness, uh, what, what are some telltale signs that, like in a hospital setting, when someone is committed to an, uh, a hospital, when they're in that hospital setting, what can the staff do to work through those feelings so that it doesn't go down the route of suicide? Well, we can do a lot before that, first okay. of all. Yep. So when somebody's feeling sad, well, we all feel sad at some point. But people with depression, sadness goes on and on and is intractable. By that I mean it lasts 14 days, 30 days, months at a time. People also lose their energy. They feel very low energy. Their sleep gets impaired. Uh, sometimes they sleep too much. Sometimes they can't sleep. Sometimes they're agitated. Right. They keep restless and they move around. Usually appetite's impaired. People lose their appetite or they eat too much. and. Uh, Usually what a big part of this is a sense of hopelessness. And then people start thinking that there's nothing worth living for, I don't feel connected to my loved ones, and then they start thinking of killing themselves. So if we can treat that before it gets to such a low level of despair, then people don't get to the level of thinking about suicide. Well, I think it's, when we're talking about suicide, I think the the important fact is that it is preventable because a lot of people don't feel it is. I mean, I myself am bipolar, and I've been down the suicide path. I'm, I'm a multiple attempter, and what I felt as someone in that situation was the hopelessness, the, the feeling I think that a lot of folks get is that their family and friends do not understand where these feelings come from and, and can't imagine a lot, of, a lot of the feedback I got and, you know, Family and friends try their best to help you, but a lot is that it's the cowardly way out. That's a, a strategy that a lot of folks seem to use. And I think that's people who are thinking of suicide, when, when they hear feedback like that from family and loved ones, what, what, um, what would you tell a, a loved one uh, of a family member who is talking about this and is saying, you know, if you don't help me, I'm gonna go through with this. How, how can, when it gets to that level, when it's that, you know, that intense, what would be, I mean, is it something, just call 911? What would they do in that situation? Well, there's many things they can do. Okay. And most of them have to do with staying connected. So feeling connected to the person who's so desperate, helping that person get therapeutic help. And by therapeutic help, we can either talk about going to see your primary care doctor or the mental health center 
or a psychiatrist, or if you're a student at the uh, student uh, counseling center, or if you're at work through um, the, the support system at work. But overall, any way to get connected to a treatment program. And the treatment program just can be one therapist or right. one we, doctor. You, you brought up a, a point actually I'd like to touch on. Um, support system, how important is that for someone with a mental illness? Well, it's crucial. Suicide is a sense of being disconnected from everybody. People with mental illness start to feel very isolated and cut off. People with depression, uh, depression really cuts away your connections to other people. Bipolar disorder and schizoaffective disorder are ways of losing connection to the people that you really care about in life. So those are all pathways that make somebody feel more desperate and want to kill themselves. Anything that makes you feel connected, talking, being with somebody, is anti-suicide and suicide preventing. Now, in your experience, um, do you feel that people who are feeling helpless self-medicate with alcohol or drugs or any other substance that way? Well, that's very common. We know that about 50% of suicides are associated with alcohol. Really? Unfortunately, when people feel sad and it uh, stretches into a depression, uh, you don't know what to do. And if you don't have a way of getting help, then often alcohol seems like the best method. Unfortunately, what alcohol does is it is a depressant, so it oh, makes it the depression okay. worse. And alcohol is also um, an anti-inhibitor. So the normal things that inhibit us from stopping us from hurting ourselves tend to be dissolved when you get drunk. So you're much more likely to act on something hurtful when you're drinking. Um, I, Alex, uh, our producer, had a thing that was released in the paper that, and it's startling to me, that more than one person in the Bay State commits suicide every day. To me, I, I, I know that to me is very startling that one person is a day, you know, in, in, uh, in this state is completing a suicide. Does that, does that figure strike with you? Does that seem more than you would suspect or less? Well, it's a terribly high figure. It's okay. about 8% per 100,000, okay. and there's about over 500 per year in Massachusetts. Um, for the whole country, there's about 33,000 per year, which is an, just an enormous figure. It sure is, yeah. It's uh, about the eighth leading cause of death in adults. And it's a, a true tragedy because a lot of this can be prevented. Also, it's a tragedy because the consequences are so terrible consequences to people who've lost somebody to suicide are, um, are just huge repercussions of painful self-blame and um, worry. Do you, when you had mentioned the word survivors, I just want to be clear on what survivor means because it has a dual meaning. Um, survivors of the actual attempt as well as the survivors of people who have completed a suicide. How, how do you um, handle the emotions of both those parties? Okay, so those are two separate but connected parties. In general terms, we think of survivors as people who've lost a loved one to suicide. These family members are devastated and want to find a way to explain the unexplained, to answer questions that can't be answered, and to recover from something that feels almost impossible to recover. Such a loss feels so, so impossible to recover from. People who attempt suicide and survive are left with their own problems. They still face the issues of the mental illness, they still face the desperation, and they still face the consequences of how other people treat them if they share with them what's happened. So they're in a very difficult position of both having to deal with illness and having to deal with relationships in society. Yeah, it's very, um it's been difficult for me to sort of even broach the subject with someone that, you know, I, I am someone who attempted. So I imagine for other folks, they may feel the same thing, that it's something you don't just blurt out and say, oh, by the way, I did attempt suicide. Because there's the stigma. Is, I mean, do you think there's a stigma for okay. someone? There's a huge stigma. Well, there's a huge stigma with mental illness. We know that, and we're yeah. trying to overcome that. And then there's a huge stigma about suicide. And there's a huge stigma about deliberate self-harm, people who cut themselves and hurt themselves through mental illness. So we're facing stigma all over the place. How do we conquer that? 
Well, by talking about it and by realizing that this is part of an illness, that people are reacting to a chemical change about an illness that's usually depression, almost always it's unipolar or bipolar depression. Oftentimes, as I said, it's complicated by alcohol or drug use. Sometimes it's got to do with um, disorders of thinking and having a schizoaffect or schizophrenic type illness. But uh, almost in all the studies, almost always it's been shown that there's a mental illness that leads people to suicide. So let's, let's put a positive spin on this. How, what role does medication therapy play in, in someone who is either thinking or has attempted? Well, we can treat mental illness. In this year, we are able to provide medication that are antidepressants, that are mood stabilizers, and that are antipsychotics so that people can think clearly and recover from depression. We can also provide psychotherapy and there's many forms of psychotherapy. Usually it's one-on-one, -on -one, and usually it's with a clinician um, who's had some experience in treating these illnesses, and usually it's once a week, and people can get better over a few weeks to a few months. Sometimes it takes place in groups, and sometimes it takes place with the, uh, the partner, like the spouse, or with families. But almost always it's individual psychotherapy, and usually weekly. Let me ask you, um, what role does religion or spirituality play in someone who is contemplating suicide? It's an interesting question because it has a mixed role. You see, on the one hand, religion gives people some connection. They hold on to their belief in God and to the scriptures and to members of their church and to the church itself, and it's very helpful. At the same time, when people are in a very bad depression, then what do they do? they feel either they've been abandoned by God or that they can't explain it, and then they feel even more guilty about having these bad thoughts about wanting to kill themselves. So there's two sides to it. There's well, with faith and spirituality or religion, for that matter, um, there are people who are going to believe in it and use it as a tool to help them with their illness, and there are people who aren't going to. So for the people who don't have the spiritual feelings, uh, what can they grab onto? We have the support system you talked about, but for someone who's out there uh, watching the show right now and feeling kind of helpless, what, would, what is their immediate action they should take? Speak to someone. Speak to your friend. Speak to your spouse. Speak to your children. Um, if you've got a connection at work, speak to that person. If you're a spiritual person, speak to somebody at church. But relate to somebody. Talk to somebody. Share, share some of what your life is about. Now, would you say that uh, you had mentioned depression? Is depression and some kind of loneliness the only cause of suicide? It's not the only, but it's the major one. It's the major Almost one. everyone that I've seen who's become what I've heard of who, who killed themselves was dealing with depression. Sometimes it can be other mental disorders like bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia. And these are all disorders of thinking, so people don't think clearly. But, uh, and sometimes they make bad decisions to hurt themselves in the midst of these um, psychotic thinking storms. Again, we can treat that. We do have medications that work to help that's, clarify that's thinking. That's the good news. That's, that's the, now, as we wrap up, um, how can people get in touch with you or the foundation, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention? What would they do? They can look us up on the web, yeah. www.afsp.org, and um, they'll find someone They'll find a connection to somebody local in Massachusetts and the uh, national uh, connections. Well, I, I appreciate, uh, Dr. Goldbaugh, you coming in today. It's a lot of good information, and I really think that the fact that suicide is preventable, that it's not hopeless, I think that message is important, and I'm glad you came on the show. Appreciate you having me here. My pleasure. And that's another episode of The Other Side. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Mark Goldblatt. And we'll see you shortly. Take care, folks. For years, scientists have explored remote corners of the Earth, searching for exotic substances that might help prevent cancer. At last, man has discovered a secret place where powerful remedies can actually be found. Medical research shows that a vegetarian diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains can help prevent many types of cancer. Wherever you live, cancer prevention is as close as your grocery store. To learn more, call 866-906-WELL. Join us this fall at Step Out, Walk to Fight Diabetes. Bring your friends, family, and co-workers to walk with thousands of people from across the country and help us change the future of diabetes.
The money you raise will make a difference. Together, we can stop diabetes one step at a time. Register today at 1-888-DIABETES or visit diabetes.org slash step out. You said. Yeah, come on, you promised. Well, the deal was you had to finish your homework first. Okay. Throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Tips on staying involved. Just one of the many ways PTA can help enrich your child's learning experience and life. Join us today. PTA. Every child, one voice. Making sure playgrounds are safe. Just one of the many ways PTA can help you create a healthy environment for your child. I'm fine. Join us today. PTA. Every child, one voice. Hello, we are back with uh, Dr. Mark Goldblatt. Um, and we are talking today about suicide prevention. Mark is an expert on suicide prevention. And we've been talking about uh, some of the causes for suicide, some of the prevention me methods a person can take. Uh, Mark, we, off, off the air we were talking, what about treatment options? What does a person have when they're in treatment? Well, if you're worried about a loved one who you think is suicidal, um, talk to them first and find out what's going on for them. People will tell you if they've given up hope. Uh, sometimes they might hide it, but then you could see that they um, might be planning um, to give away all their positions. Sometimes they talk about writing a will and what should happen with things. People will generally let you know what's on their mind. And if you pick that up, then it's really important to get them some help. And you can get help either through your primary care doctor or through um, help at school or help at work. Or uh, if all else fails, take them into the emergency room. Most people don't need to be hospitalized. Once people are diagnosed with depression, that can be easily treated. Most depressions will respond to antidepressant medication and psychotherapy. Um, sometimes either or, the data seems to show that people do best with both. And these medications seem to work over a couple of weeks, usually three to four weeks they take to work, and sometimes six or eight weeks. But generally there's recovery from depression in a few months, and with support from a therapist, those few months can be fairly safe. Um, in terms of, well, we talk about treatment. Uh, if someone is given a, a prolonged period of time in a mental health facility because of an attempt, um, if they're in there for a, an extended period of time, say four to six months, uh, when, they, when they are discharged from the hospital, what can they take away from the treatment that they can use in everyday life so that they don't go down that road of suicide again? Well, first of all, most people don't get hospitalized for that long. Nowadays in Massachusetts, the hospitalization times are very short. People, very, people often wonder that if I go and tell somebody that I'm not thinking right or I don't feel that I can live, that they'll be locked away for a long time, like four, four months or four years, and they'll never see the light of day again. But nowadays, that's mostly not true. But is that, is that, or is that good or bad? Because what if someone, I mean, a lot, uh, you know, myself being hospitalized, a lot of people that I met, uh, people who were ill, talk their way out of the hospital. Very, you can be very clever and say, oh, you know, I feel fine. No, I'm not thinking of hurting myself. Well, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's, uh, it's bad in that uh, sometimes people don't get all the help that they need. But it's also reassuring to know that you're not going to be locked away and lose control of your life and that you're, you're not going to have the ability to uh, go on with your life. So most times people are hospitalized for a few days, maybe one or two weeks if, uh, things, if it's really a bad depression. And then people learn certain skills in the hospital. And most of all, they, they start uh, a treatment program. And what really helps about the treatment program is they get to feel that they're connected again, usually with their family and their friends. And that's, that's what's mostly life-preserving. Uh, is um, constant supervision 
of the utmost importance when someone has either attempted or is thinking about attempting? Only if you think they're about to act on it. If you think somebody's about to kill themselves, then absolutely don't let them out of, this, out of your sight. Call 911 and stay with them all the time. Most depressions aren't like that. Most depressions, people think about it, people think they ought to do it, people think I'm gonna make a plan and then they work on a plan. But that's really way down the road. Uh, early on in the disease, people are thinking about it and if they can get help at that place, then they don't need constant supervision and they can get by with usually once or twice a week psychotherapy and medication. Is there any, this is a little off the, off the beaten path, but are there any um, natural or herbal things that, that someone could take to, in addition to psychotherapy and regular medication, are there any alternative methods someone could use to help themselves? Well, psychotherapy works and psychotherapy works without medication. And we know psychotherapy works to help people come out of depression. Psychotherapy works a little bit for uh, distorted thinking that you get in schizoaffective or schizophrenic illness, but generally you need an antipsychotic medication. And psychotherapy can help people stabilize with mood disorders, but not as much as a real mood uh, disorder medication like lithium or Depakote or Tegretol. What about, oh, uh, just throwing this out there, um, some of the medications that you take cause some significant side effects. So the fact the side effects alone can cause depression. So how does someone, you know, you're taking something for a, a, an illness, then they say, okay, you know what, you're gonna be dealing with weight gain, you're gonna be dealing with, how, do, how does someone come out of the depression and deal with s those kind of things? Well, that's a really big challenge. Now, all our medications have side effects, but then aspirin has side effects too. Nowadays, we have medications that have less side effects than before but commonly the side effects are weight gain and sexual impairment. And these are two big, two big problems to deal with. Absolutely. So sometimes this stops people from taking the medication, but you're really weighing up the horrors of the side effects versus the horrors of depression. Absolutely. And most times if you work with your doctor, you can find a way to have the side effects be not so bad. We've got a lot of alternatives, so there's no reason to stay with a medication that's giving bad side effects. And if you can uh, get in contact with your doctor earlier on, then these problems don't get too bad. Do you think um, the public does enough and the media does enough to bring attention to suicide in, in today's world? No, no, no. I don't think we really understand mental illness and it's not well portrayed in the media and in the movies and in books. And the real suffering that people go through and how they try and bravely cope with life under very difficult circumstances is not really well portrayed. So how do, how do we fix that? How do, we get the, how do we get the media and the public to support these people? By being real, by telling people exactly how we feel about our lives and in the right place about what's, what we're going through and uh, having a frank discussion about uh, the costs of mental illness, both the interpersonal costs, the financial costs, the relational costs, and the progress that we've made in trying to treat these illnesses. Would you say suicide is an epidemic in this country? I don't know if it's an epidemic. The, the rates have been pretty constant. We've got a rate of about eight per 100,000 in Massachusetts, and overall in the whole country about 11 or 12%. And it's been kind of around there for most, most of my lifetime, the last 20, 30 years, with a little bit of variation. It seems to have gotten worse with the current e economy, and I don't know, it's a little too soon to know what that means. Uh, these, these rates, we only see the full effect two or three or five years later. That's, that brings up another point. Well, we got all kinds of good information today. Um, what role does um, someone who's jobless, someone who doesn't even have, a, there are people who don't have an illness that attempt because they, other things in the family, things with the economy, like you said, how do you treat, help someone who doesn't have an illness deal with those kind of factors? Well, the data seems to show that even those people have an illness, that those people, you know, if you lose your job and you're having trouble making ends meet, it's very easy to slip into a depression. Now, it's very difficult to get yourself back into the workforce as it is, and it's made a whole lot more difficult if you've got a depression as well which is understandable given the difficulties of the circumstances. So most people who kill themselves, even in today's economy, it might be precipitated by losses of job or divorce or things like that. 
but it's almost always associated with a superimposed depression. What, what age group is most at risk? Elderly men. Oh, are, really? Are highly at risk. They, they tend to act on suicidal thoughts. Younger women tend to hurt themselves or try and kill themselves, but not as, uh, they're, they're, they're more at risk for hurting themselves. Um, it seems like it's throughout the age group getting worse as uh, people get older and that men are more lethal than women. It's worse when it's associated with alcohol and it's much worse if there's firearms in the house. Well, but elderly men, is it, is it just a hopelessness or is it maybe losing a spouse and living alone or? Well, it's almost always associated with illness. Yeah. So depression seems to hit uh, elderly men very hard and probably as a group, they're not used to getting help. They might be self-medicating with alcohol and avoiding telling anyone how badly they feel, how hopeless they get. Uh, in terms of um, when someone's being treated, what I know we talked a little bit about, but what is a loose time frame when someone comes to their therapist and says, you know, I'm having thoughts. What, what kind of, when can we expect them to turn the corner? When someone, I know everyone's different, but is there a loose time frame where someone can actually start to feel hopeful rather than hopeless? I think coming to see somebody, especially coming to see a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist, starts to build some hope. People generally feel a bit better in a couple of weeks. The medications take about four to six weeks to work. Yep. And so the time frame is about one to two to three months. In psychotherapy, what are some of the approaches um, medical pro professionals take? And I know treating someone who's suicidal might be a little different than treating someone who's just a, somewhat depressed. Is there, is there a different technique to someone who's acutely in an acute state? Well, it varies from therapist to therapist. It seems like all kinds of therapies work. The important thing is to get to therapy. What works is uh, kind of an academic question, but I think what works is connecting about internal feelings. So connecting with the patient's internal state, which is usually a state of sadness, loneliness, sometimes anger, sometimes intolerable shame but finding a way to share that and to overcome those internal intolerable experiences. So as, as we wrap up, Dr. Goldblatt, this is not a hopeless situation. There's a lot of hopefulness in this. Absolutely. There's, there's hope given that these illnesses are treatable and that they're treatable really quite efficiently with medication, with psychotherapy, and with engagement with the healthcare system and with the mental health system. And if someone out there would like to reach you um, for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which you're the president of, how would they get in touch with you? Well, for the National uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, they can go to www.afsp.org and they'll find a link to the Massachusetts uh, branch. Excellent. Well, Dr. Goldblatt, I want to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad to have you on. My pleasure. Uh, that's another episode of The Other Side. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Mark Goldblatt, for his information. Uh, we'll see you soon, folks, and take care of yourselves.